Nicholas said, those who want freedom and justice without struggle are like those who want the crops to grow without the rain. It is struggle, not a sure thing. It's in our future. We owe the future nothing less than to learn the analysis that Mr. Greenwald has put forward and to learn from him how it is we have to struggle. Mr. Greenwald. Good evening, and thanks so much for coming this evening, and thank you as well to the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, not only for inviting me to speak with you this evening, but even more so for the truly important and impressive work that they've done over the last year and a half since they're founded. Approximately two weeks ago, there was an amazing article in the New York Times, or at least in the online version of the New York Times, and what was amazing about it wasn't so much what it said, but it was amazing because of who wrote it. It wasn't written by some Muslim activist or some radical lawyer or, or dissident or anything like that. It was written by Andy Rosenthal, who is the editorial page editor of the New York Times, probably one of the most mainstream and establishment media positions that it can be in, in the United States. And, and what he said, in the first paragraph of his online column, he observed very matter-of-factly that the United States has created, quote, essentially a separate system of justice for Muslims. Has created a separate system of justice for Muslims. And the reason I say I don't think that's extraordinary because of what it said is because anybody who has watched the United States over the past decade knows that to be the case. It's not even in reasonable dispute or controversy that there is a separate system of justice for Muslims. What's amazing to me about it is the fact that somebody who is so mainstream and in such an establishment position can make that observation so matter-of-factly, but even more so that that observation of such a pernicious and extraordinary fact triggers almost no controversy or even notice. It was the proverbial tree that fell in the middle of the forest. Barely anybody paid attention to it or heard it. And that's why I'm so honored and delighted to be able to speak with you here tonight because I really do believe that the coalition at its core, both the individual members that compose it and the coalition itself are really devoted to correcting that extreme deficiency. Not just those injustices themselves, the creation of a separate justice system, but the fact that our citizenry has permitted it to take root and to grow for a full decade with such apathy and indifference. Now, I think there are a couple of ways to look at this development, that there is a separate system of justice for Muslims in the United States. One way to look at it is to simply view it as the latest in a long line of historical examples in which particular groups have been singled out in the United States to be demonized in order to keep the population's fear level high and to justify all sorts of power and authority in the United States government. There have been lots of groups in the United States historically that have played the same role. Immigrants played that role for a very long time. Japanese Americans played that role during World War II. Black Americans have played it for centuries. And for several decades, the role was principally taken by the communists. It was the communists that was the great enemy of the United States, both foreign and domestic, that justified the endless war and militarism, constant surveillance and the like. And as Professor Arlinder alluded to, once the Soviet Union fell and there was no more communist threat to point to and to exploit and to use, there was a need for another enemy. And seamlessly, that enemy was created and replaced communism, and it was called the terrorist, and quickly in the public mind that became Muslims. And what's really remarkable about that is if you go back and look to American history in the 20th century, you can find all kinds of warnings from people about the danger that this was going to take place. You can look, for example, to the 1961 farewell address of Dwight Eisenhower, another non-radical speaker, the five-star general who commanded U.S. troops 
in World War II and then served as a two-term Republican president who warned in his farewell address in 1961 famously that the conglomeration of private military industry and the U.S. government was creating what he called the military industrial complex that would become even more powerful than democratically elected leaders. They would exist beyond the realm of accountability. And it certainly got infinitely worse in the five decades since he delivered that address. And what he warned was that in order for it to perpetuate itself, it would constantly need to find the pretext for war and for militarism. And the prerequisite for that is to always have a group that the population can focus on in order to feel sufficiently afraid that it believes militarism and expanding government authority and an erosion of civil liberties is both warranted and necessary. So the population not only accepts those erosions, but cries out for them, calls for them, and demands them. And so you can look at Islamophobia and the way in which Muslims have been de demonized and anyone associated with causes that are perceived to be Muslim in the United States as yet another iteration of this dynamic. And there is some truth to that. But the other way of looking at it is the one that I actually think is more persuasive, and that is that there is a lot of things unique about what is taking place in the United States with regard to how Muslims are used and exploited to justify these assaults. And I just want to make a couple of observations about why I think it is unique historically. And I want to begin by looking at what I think is a very remarkable paradox that has taken place since the 9-11 attacks. And the paradox is this. After the attacks of September 11th, I think it's natural to be expected in the weeks or months after the attack that the United States government and the American citizenry would react excessively to the threat. That is a normal and natural reaction for human beings to have, not just in the United States, but across the spectrum of human nature. You can look at human beings who are confronted by immediate threats and they often overreact. It's just a defense mechanism. So it isn't really surprising that there were all kinds of lines transgressed and all kinds of excesses committed during that immediate period in the aftermath. But we're now 10 years removed, more than 10 years removed, from the last attack, terrorist attack, on US soil allegedly committed by Muslims, at least that we know of. There was an anthrax attack after that, there have been other attacks, but that was the, first, the only successful attack committed by people who have been identified as being motivated by allegiance to a religion or a set of political views. And yet, 10 years later removed from that terrorist threat, one would expect that as the threat recedes, the demand for greater government power, the demand for more and more militarism, the demand for renunciation of core liberties would recede along with the threat. And yet the great paradox is that isn't happening. Exactly the opposite is happening. As we move further and further away from that threat, as it becomes less proximate in the public mind, the policies that are justified in its name, the assaults on core liberties, actually continue to intensify. Every step that's taken in this realm is always in the step of more militarism more assaults on civil liberties, less freedom, more targeting of Muslims. It's because, as Dwight Eisenhower warned, the system has become self-perpetuating. Even when it has no real threat to justify itself, it finds and concocts threats. It continues to proceed and to grow and expand, even when the pretext for it no longer exists. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Once you go down that path, it's very difficult to remove yourself from it, even when the original justification for it has been confined. The second aspect that I think makes the threat even more difficult and, and more pernicious and dangerous and, and explains its uniqueness is that there has been a real shift in rhetoric and tactics and strategy in terms of how these civil liberties erosions are justified and how they manifest. So if you look at the four or five or six years after the September 11th attacks, the focus 
in terms of government propaganda and rhetoric and even policy was primarily on foreign threats. Al-Qaeda was the symbol of the threat that Americans needed to protect themselves from. These threats typically took place off of American soil. There were certainly lots of American Muslims in that initial period that were targeted in all sorts of ways, but the principal focus rhetorically and propagandistically was on things taking place outside of the United States. And what has happened over the last three or four years is that has completely shifted as well. So if you listen now to not just people like Peter King, but even high-ranking national security officials in the Obama administration, the emphasis that they constantly highlight is that the great threat to the American people is now what they call homegrown terrorism. Meaning terrorists who are not hiding any longer in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Yemen and Somalia, but who are American citizens or legal residents of the United States living and working on American soil. And what that has meant is that all of those excesses that were once principally focused outside of the United States are now being imported onto American soil, not on a case-by-case -case basis, but systematically. So that if you look, for example, at the recent intensifications of the civil liberties assault that I just described, you see things like the dilution of Miranda rights for people accused but never convicted of terrorism, or the enactment of a statute that took place at the end of last year as part of the National Defense Authorization Act to codify the practice and power of the government to indefinitely detain people including on American soil, or the proliferation of sprawling surveillance programs directed not at foreign nationals outside of the United States, but at Muslim mosques and communities. You see the importation of these abuses from what they were in the wake of 9-11, which was taking place on foreign soil, largely but not exclusively, almost exclusively now, in a very systematic way, onto American soil. And then the third factor that I would identify that, that really, I think, makes this unique historically is the following. I had this realization actually quite recently. I went to speak at a university in Indiana about the state of civil liberties and, and the war on terror and the Obama administration, and there were several high school students who drove from Kentucky several hundred miles in order to attend this event. And the reason that they did that was because they were publishing a high school newspaper that was expressing some views that the school administrators found politically controversial and they were being censored by the school administrators and they wanted to come and interview me so that I would say insulting and mean things about the school administrators, which I happily did, and, and they wrote an article about that. Um, and, and yet, they, they talked to me after I, I spoke and I had spoken about civil liberties and I talked about the dramatic and radical changes that took place in the United States in terms of basic liberties and how the government functions after September 11. And one of the girls who was in attendance, the high school girl who was in the, the 10th or 11th grade, said to me, you know, you speak a lot about this idea. Everything that you say is grounded in this concept that there was a pre-9-11 America where all of these freedoms and liberties were taken for granted and were natural. And now there's this post-9-11 America where these civil liberties have been eroded in the name of threats from Muslims. And she said, one of the things that is so important that I hope you think about is the fact that I'm 15 years old, she said. And all of my peers are 15 or 16 years old. And when 9-11 happened, we were four years old or five years old. So that the generation that is currently in high school and coming of age, and even entering college, for them there is no such thing as this pre-9-11 world where things were once different and a post-9-11 world where things have changed. The post-9-11 world forms the entirety of their political consciousness. Which means that all of these developments that we call radical, for them have become normalized. And all of the ways that Muslims have been depicted in popular media since September 11th, for them, is all they know. And that, too, is an extremely odious development, which I really focused on as a result of what she said to me, that I think makes this trend even more threatening in terms of how entrenched it is and difficult to combat. Now, one of the points that I wanted to make tonight has already been made extremely eloquently by Mr. Ali, by Mr. Downs, by this board over here, which is, 
it's very easy, I think, to gather in places like this or to write about these issues as I do almost every day and to become angry at these injustices but still think of them as an abstraction. And one of the reasons why I travel so much around to events like this and one of the benefits that it really provides to me in terms of my motivation is that it personalizes not just how intense these injustices are, but also how pervasive they are, how universal they are, especially among Muslim communities in the United States, but even among people who are engaged in any sort of constitutionally protected, dissident, political activism. And I say that because almost everywhere I go, not by planning it, but simply coincidentally, I encounter people whose lives are affected in all sorts of devastating and horrendous ways by these injustices that we talk about in the abstract. So just on the trip that I'm currently on, I began in, on Wednesday in Ottawa, Canada, where I was invited to speak by the National Press Club at the Journalism University there. And Ottawa just so happens to be the place that Mar Mahar Arar lives, who is the Syrian-Canadian citizen who was abducted by the United States in 2002 at JFK Airport and in collaboration with his own government in Canada, rendered to Jordan and then to Syria, where he was kept for nine months in solitary confinement and brutally tortured, only for everybody to realize at some point thereafter that they simply have the wrong person. Although the person that they wanted has never all been charged with any sort of crime or wrongdoing of any kind. And, and Mr. Arar has attempted to obtain justice in American courts and has had the courthouse doors shut in his face by virtue of both the Bush and the Obama administrations insisting to courts that what was done to him was too secret and that to allow him even to be heard in an American court would jeopardize the disclosure of state secrets. And I heard from him how he had a promising career as an academician, he has a PhD in engineering, and all of that has been sidetracked by virtue of his disappearance and his now eight year long battle to obtain some minimal justice for himself. He obviously has all kinds of emotional and psychological afflictions that he's very bravely spoken about quite openly by virtue of literally being snatched away by virtue of his religion and his ethnicity and brutally tortured in a place to which he no longer had any connection. And then after I was in Ottawa, I, I flew to Chicago and I spoke last night at the University of Chicago and was on a panel there, and I was invited there by the Muslim Student Association of the University of Chicago, who's, one of whose leaders happens to be the son of Dr. Sami Alari. His name is Ali, and he's a, a very uh, committed and passionate University of Chicago student, and he happened to drive me back to my hotel after the event was over, and he recounted to me the extraordinary impression and injustices that his father has been subjected to for the last nine years when the US government has deprived him of his liberty for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And he talked to me about the effect that it has had on his father, who was a university professor at the time that this started, and his children, and the devastation that they continue to confront as a result of what Andy Rosenthal described as this separate system of justice for Muslims. And then earlier today, I was in Washington and I happened to have lunch with the brother of Gulag Mohammed, who is the 18-year-old American citizen whose family arranged for me to call while he was imprisoned in Kuwait at the behest of the U.S. government, where he was interrogated and detained without charges and beaten and tortured. And I listened to this 18-year-old American citizen in extreme distress, as anyone would be, failing to understand why this has happened to him and why his own government not only wasn't helping him, but was causing him to be in this predicament. And he was finally at some point released with virtually no explanation and eventually allowed to return to the United States where of course he's never been charged with a crime. This happens to me everywhere I go and speak at events like this. Not planning, but simply coincidentally confronting people whose lives have truly been devastated by these assaults and injustices that we can speak about a little bit too abstractly sometimes. And that really provides me with the motivation, additional motivation, to continue to work on the battle. Now, one of the things I think is important to do is, is when we talk about this separate system of justice for Muslims, I think it's important to be specific about what that means. And we've heard a lot of examples tonight about how that manifests, but I just want to highlight one in particular that 
is not really the most significant necessarily, but it's incredibly illustrative to me. It's one I've been writing about fairly frequently of late. And so I just want to highlight it briefly to illustrate what I think is the dichotomy that has arisen in how Muslims are treated. There is a very glittering and prestigious cast of bipartisan officials and former officials in Washington, equally divided between the Republican and Democratic parties by design, who have developed an, a bizarre and sudden interest in advocating on behalf of the group that the United States calls the MEK, the Iranian Dissident Group, that the State Department for 20 years or so has formally designated as a foreign ter terrorist organization. And for some reason, this bipartisan cast of Washington um, insiders have just suddenly gone around the country speaking about the urgency of removing the MEK from the list of terrorist organizations. People who have displayed zero interest in any of these issues in their entire political careers, in fact, display almost no political passion of any kind on any issue, have suddenly decided that this is the most urgent cause that Washington has to confront, to remove this group from the list of foreign terrorist organizations. And as it turns out, the Christian Science Monitor last year revealed that the vast majority of those officials, just coincidentally, have been paying huge fees, $30,000, $40,000, $50,000, to make five or 10 minute appearances where they speak, sometimes in person, sometimes by video. And they've met continuously with the leaders of this designated terrorist organization and have coordinated the messaging with these leaders as well. And the reason the MEK is something that they're willing to defend is because the MEK is one of those terrorist organizations that is currently engaged in terrorism that promotes rather than impedes the policy of the United States. NBC reported that they're funded and armed and trained by the state of Israel, that they were responsible for perpetrating the series of assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists and other explosions on Iranian soil. And so this terrorist organization is one that is working for the United States and threats rather than against. And these individuals are therefore willing to stand up so publicly and not only speak on their behalf, but meet with them in public, attend all sorts of functions in Washington for them. Now, the reason this is so significant is because, as this wall demonstrates, as we've heard already tonight, as most of you all probably already know, there are dozens and dozens of Muslims whose names most people don't know, who don't really have any connections in Washington, who have been prosecuted and who are sitting in prison for materially supporting organizations on that very same list by virtue of doing far, far, far less than Howard Dean and N. Rendell and Fran Townsend and Wesley Clark and dozens of other Washington officials are doing for the MEK. And yet it is inconceivable that those individuals will be prosecuted for materially supporting a terrorist organization, even though by every conceivable understanding of what the law is, that's precisely what they're doing. And yet here you have dozens of Muslims who are in prison for decades for exercising pure political free speech, for including a channel that is associated with Hezbollah and a package of cable channels that they were selling in Staten Island who are now sitting in a federal prison in New York, or for translating documents as Tarak Mahana did, or for uploading YouTube clips that are critical of the United States government, but because there were some conversations with relatives of people in these organizations, though they, that is materially supporting terrorist organizations, the standards are radically different. The systems really are completely dichotomized. There is one set of laws and principles for everybody in the United States, and there is a completely separate legal system, an inferior legal system, a much more impressive legal system, one that knows no boundaries of the Constitution for American Muslims or Muslims in general whose views are perceived to be antithetical to that of United States policy. And what makes it so remarkable is that that really is an extraordinary observation to make that there is a group of people in the United States who by virtue of their ethnicity and political views and religious affiliations are treated fundamentally and radically differently in the one place where equality is supposed to reign, and that is under the law. Now, I just want to talk briefly about the reasons why this happens. What is it that 
is done to sustain what we all know intrinsically as Americans, that we're all taught inherently from the time we're young is a complete and radical violation of everything that the country is supposed to guarantee. How does that happen? And how does it happen without triggering any sort of objection or protest, except in isolated circles? And I think that the most critical propagandistic tactic that needs to be understood when thinking about why this happens is the use of the word terrorism, which ever since September 11th is probably the most potent word in the American political lexicon. And what's really amazing about that fact, that the word terrorism is the most potent word in the American political lexicon, is that it is also, in my view, the most ill-defined it's an incredible paradox, the word that shapes our political discourse, that forms how Americans think about so many critical issues, that determines who goes to prison for decades, is a word that is at the center of so much of what we do, and yet lacks any real definition. You cannot find anybody who can give you a fixed definition of that word, the word terrorism, in any way that is recognized anywhere in the world, not in any court of law, not in any think tank, and not in any academic institution. And there's actually some interesting scholarship about how the word terrorism came to be, how it became so prominent. There's work that is done at NYU that traces the origins of that word and, and finds that it was really introduced into world affairs by the state of Israel in the late 1960s and early 1970s because Israel wanted the world to believe that its conflicts with its neighbors was not just about territorial disputes but was a universal problem that the West should consider its own battle, that it wasn't just them battling against their neighbors for disputed land, but was a war against terrorism. And the problem with defining that term, that was the quandary from the beginning, was that it was impossible to define the term in a way that would include violence they wanted to include, but that would exclude violence that is routinely done by Israel and the United States. There's just no way to do it. And so the tactic that they used at first was to say, well, terrorism is, lucky us, things that are done only by non-state actors. So if you are a government, you just, by definition, you can't do terrorism. It's, it's a bizarre shield of protection. And yet even that has manifested in all sorts of ways so that if Muslims target purely military targets, people in Iraq and Afghanistan who have targeted invading armies, they're called terrorists. And yet if the United States government conceives of a military tactic and calls it openly shock and awe, designed to terrorize the population of Baghdad into instant submission, the classic case of terrorism, you could never call that terrorism. It really is a word that, and this is quite amazing, that has no meaning and yet justifies everything. It really is a word that shuts down debate. It is a word that explains so much of what we're here talking about tonight. I know this from experience. If you argue that people shouldn't be tortured, you will hear, well, those are terrorists, and we need to get information from them. If you say people shouldn't be put into prison without charges, you'll immediately hear, well, those are terrorists. We need to keep them away from other human beings. If you say the president shouldn't have the power to target American citizens for assassinations without due process, you'll immediately hear, well, he was a terrorist, and therefore he had to die. It is the ultimate conversation ender, and people assume that, that when that label gets applied by the government, there must be some justification to it. It's the reason why so much of this is permitted to take place. Now, the other reason why this is permitted to take place is because the United States government does a very good job of making sure that the terrorism threat continues to exist even when it really doesn't. It's really quite remarkable. You'll hear sports fans of the United States all the time celebrate whenever a team has an undefeated streak. They won eight in a row or nine in a row or ten in a row, but the reality is the team that has the best undefeated streak in the United States is the FBI. They are incredibly successful. In fact, they have a 100% success rate at, at the last minute jumping in and saving the United States from the terrorist plots that the FBI creates and manufactures and funds and drives. They're incredibly good at this. And almost every single significant terrorist attack that the FBI has uncovered in the past five to six years 
as being ones that they single-handedly concocted. Ones that would not exist without their continuous recruitment and manipulation of typically young Muslims. And the tragedy of that is not just that people who would never have committed a crime absent that entrapment end up in prison for decades, although they do. The other tragedy is that it continues to propagandize Americans into believing that there's this grave threat posed by Americans on our own soil. It's the reason why Americans continue to support these policies and to believe that they're urgent to keep them safe from a threat that really doesn't exist. Now, the last one I, I want to talk about is the one that I think is actually the most important. And that is thinking about why it is that people are apathetic about the erosion and assault on these most basic liberties and how it is that they can be persuaded to care as much as the people in this room do. And there's a couple of reasons why people are willing to be apathetic to these developments in addition to the ones that I've just discussed. One is that people perceive that as long as these assaults are directed only at a group of people that is different from them and separate from them, namely those Muslims and their associates and friends, then there's no reason for them to care. As long as they're not affected by it, as they perceive it, then there's no reason for them to be concerned about it. And the other reason is, is that it was the case four or five years ago that there was much greater divisiveness and controversy over these developments. You heard lots of pretty vociferous debates about Guantanamo and torture and eavesdropping and surveillance. And then a Democrat got elected president and became the person presiding over those policies, and suddenly the controversies really disappeared. You have Republicans in the United States who have always been in favor of these policies, and Democrats who opposed them only so long as there was an opportunistic political gain to be made from pretending to oppose them, who now, because it's a Democrat doing it, no longer feel a reason to object. And so I think these really explain why there's such apathy towards these issues. Now, you know, there's, I think it's incumbent upon everybody to figure out the best way to convince those who think like that why they are actually affected by these developments, even if they think they're not. There's this quote here from Martin Luther King that says that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And there are just people who simply don't believe that. There are some people who simply think that as long as an injustice is over there, it's not actually over there. It's only over there. It doesn't affect me. And I'm only going to worry about injustices that directly affect me. And so for people like that, they're probably beyond the pale. You can't convince them that they should care about injustices that aren't affecting them. But what you can do is convince them that those injustices that they think don't affect them actually really do. And one way to do that is to make the not very controversial observation that whenever governments require a certain power over their citizenry, it is always the case, not often or sometimes or usually, it is always the case that those powers will be applied beyond their original justification. And you see this happening already in many different cases. The Patriot Act that was justified by the threat of terrorism in the wake of 9-11 has been abused and applied to all sorts of dissident groups in the United States to spy on all sorts of peace groups. You have people like Lynn Stewart who, although not Muslim, was targeted by the U.S. government because of her brave and intrepid advocacy on behalf of Muslims that the government didn't like. I recently wrote about a filmmaker whose name is Laura Poitras, who has created, who has uh, produced two documentaries, one of which was nominated for the Academy Award about uh, showing the devastation that U.S. policy in Iraq and Yemen produces every single time she re-enters the country. She's detained at the border. She's questioned extensively, sometimes for hours, about who she met and where she went and why she went there. Her laptops and reporters' notebooks and cameras and cell phones are often seized without any warrant and kept for weeks and copied. In other words, her most private communications are invaded. It has already extended wildly beyond its original application, and history proves that it will continue to. So anybody who is content that these abuses will remain confined only to this group is deluding themselves. 
These abuses spread rapidly and inevitably in ways that people can't predict. But I think the more important point is a little bit difficult to convey, but I think it's extremely important to grapple with, and this is the last point I want to make, is that when you allow civil liberty erosions and the destruction of core freedoms to take hold, what it really does is it changes the relationship between the citizenry and its government. It really creates a climate of fear that imposes a tyranny that is actually more effective than tyrannies that are just overt. And I just want to convey an anecdote, a personal anecdote that uh, I encountered that really highlighted that, that fact to me in a very visceral way. Um, I spent a couple of years now writing fairly frequently about WikiLeaks, the group that discloses government secrets in the name of transparency, and I typically write in, in defense of that group and, and argue why their prosecution would be a grave threat to press freedoms, and, and I talk about the promise that I think that group holds. And the first time that I ever wrote about WikiLeaks, actually the first time I ever heard about WikiLeaks, was in January of 2010, more than a couple of years ago now. And this was at a time when almost nobody had heard of this group. It was before they had done any of their newsmaking disclosures, before they even produced and published a video showing US helicopters in Baghdad gunning down unarmed civilians and Reuters journalists. And the way that I had come to learn about WikiLeaks was that the Pentagon, in 2008, prepared a report that it classified as top secret. And the report said it, it declared WikiLeaks to be an enemy of the state, an enemy of the United States. And it plotted ways that the Pentagon would work to destroy WikiLeaks. They would fabricate documents and submit them to WikiLeaks so that when WikiLeaks published them, their credibility would be destroyed. It would uncover the identity of their sources so that nobody would feel comfortable link, uh, linking to them any longer. It was a report that really said that WikiLeaks was a grave threat to everything that the Pentagon was attempting to achieve. And ironically enough, this report got leaked to WikiLeaks, which then published it. And the New York Times wrote a short report about this, a short article about this report, um, which I read. And I, I read that, I read the report and I, I read the article and I, I saw that the Pentagon had actually set out to destroy WikiLeaks. And I remember at the time thinking that any group that the Pentagon was declaring to be an enemy of the state and was plotting to destroy was one that deserved a lot more of attention and probably a lot of support. So I went and I did a lot of research about what WikiLeaks had done, and I found that they had engaged in all sorts of important disclosures. They had uncovered corruption in, in Africa on the part of corporations. They had uncovered government deceit in Australia and Norway. I could see that the template of the model was extremely promising to explode the wall of secrecy behind which the US government and its national security state operates. And I wrote a long article about WikiLeaks and the promise that it held. And I interviewed Julian Assange and I published the interview, the audio of the interview that I had done with him. And at the end of the article, I encouraged people to donate money to WikiLeaks because they had budgetary constraints and they were unable to process some of the important leaks they were sitting on, the ones that they ended up releasing about Iraq and Afghanistan and, and the diplomatic cables. And I provided a link to the PayPal account and I gave some information about how people could donate money digitally or wiring into their bank account. And in response to my article, and specifically my encouraging people to donate money to them, I had dozens of people, maybe even hundreds, definitely dozens and dozens of people, who said to me basically the same thing. In my comment section to that article, by email, at, at venues like this, they said, look, and these were American citizens, they said, I am convinced that WikiLeaks holds great promise and, and is an organization that deserves to be supported. I definitely see that and convinced me of that. But the problem is I am, I'm actually afraid to donate money to WikiLeaks because I feel like if I donate money to WikiLeaks, especially digitally, then I'm going to end up on a government list somewhere. Or that potentially in the future, if WikiLeaks is declared to be a terrorist organization, I may be subject to criminal liability for providing material support to terrorism. And the reason that was so eye-opening for me, I mean, these were not conspiratorial people prone to paranoia. These were well-rounded, rational people. The reason that was so jarring to me was because these were people who, out of fear of what the United States government could do to them, 
who are voluntarily relinquishing their own core First Amendment freedoms, which is what donating money to a political organization whose cause we support is. It's a right of free speech, a right of free assembly and petition. They were afraid to exercise their own rights. This is the climate of fear that gets created when people know they have a government that does and can cross any lines without any repercussions. And what's so amazing about that is that you can offer all the rights in the world and all the constitutional guarantees you want on a piece of paper or a piece of parchment, but if the government successfully intimidates people through this climate of fear out of exercising them, those rights become completely meaningless. In December 2010, I wrote an article that was the first article written about the subject detailing the extremely inhumane and oppressive conditions in which Private Bradley Manning was being detained. He is the accused leaker of most of those documents to WikiLeaks. And I detailed the conditions that the UN high official on torture just two months ago concluded after a formal investigation constituted cruel and inhumane punishment. He was subjected to prolonged solitary confinement. He was sadistically subjected to rituals of answering guards, inquiries every five minutes. He was barred from exercising in his own cell. The kinds of conditions to which American prisoners are routinely subjected, but much more extreme, and without having ever been charged with, let alone convicted of a crime. And I remember at the time that I wrote the article, I had the question that arose. I found it sort of baffling, and I had a lot of people ask me this question as well, which was, why would the U.S. government possibly want to subject Bradley Manning to these conditions? It seems to be counterproductive, contrary to their interests. For one thing, if the, he makes statements that are incriminating, he, it would be difficult to use those statements against him while prosecuting him because they could claim it was coerced. They had created emotional sympathy for him. The Obama administration's own State Department spokesman ended up resigning in protest, and I couldn't really figure out why they would want to do this. And then after thinking about it a little bit longer, I realized that the reason that they subjected Bradley Manning to those kinds of conditions, those brutally inconvenient and oppressive conditions, is the same reason that the U.S. government abducted people from around the world and shipped them thousands of miles away to a Caribbean island and dressed them in orange jumpsuits and shackles and showed the world what they had done. It's the same reason the United States continues to kill civilians at will using drones and cluster bombs and other instruments of death. It's the same reason the United States created a regime of torture. It is a way of signaling not only to people outside of the United States, but also to American citizens. That if you are somebody who, like Riley Manning, discovers things that we've done in secret that are deceitful and illegal, and think about exposing it to the world, think twice about it because look what we've done to him. Or if you're somebody who wants to oppose American conduct in the world in any meaningful way, look at this wall of people whom we've consigned to a cage for doing nothing more than what the U.S. Constitution guarantees people the right to do, or look at the corpses that we've created around the world without any repercussions. It's a way of signaling to people that there is no line that we can't cross. There is nothing that we can't do to you without any repercussions. It is a way of intimidating and deterring people out of the right to challenge what the United States government does. There is a real insidiousness to that framework, to that climate of fear, because what ends up happening is people convince themselves that they are free even when they're not. They convince themselves that they don't really want to engage in real dissent. They don't really want to challenge the assertion of power. They don't really want to engage in any meaningful impediment of the United States government because they've been frightened out of doing it. And once they convince themselves that they don't really want to do those things, they don't even realize the assaults on their freedoms because they tell themselves, well, there's nothing I want to do that I'm unable to do. The socialist activist Rosa Luxemburg put it this way. She said, he who does not move does not notice his own chains. He who does not move does not notice his own chains. It is incredibly easy, incredibly effective to put a population into such fear that they no longer even view real dissent as a possibility. And I think that's really the most insidious and most subtle but most significant erosion that has taken place in the United States. And the real danger, as I started off by talking about, is that if these changes become sufficiently normalized, if enough people no longer even realize 
that there's another way these changes become irreversible. I think everybody in this room, by virtue of the fact that you're here, doesn't believe that it is yet irreversible. I certainly don't believe it is, but the work to make sure that it doesn't become so is extremely important work. And the coalition, which we're all gathered here to support, is, is really at the forefront of that fight, and, and that's why I hope you support that group and, and, and continue to support its work as, as much as I do and my own so honored to be able to speak tonight. Thanks very much.